thank you for joining us for the Fault Line Bible Study today. Hey, we know we're going to be sharing the most familiar verse on the planet. But how really familiar are you with it? Open up your Bible. We're going to be looking at John 3.16 today. And I believe God will have a blessing for you. Gather people around if you've got some friends that you know that need Jesus. Whether they're Christians or not. They may want to hear this. God bless you. And we'll see what kind of blessings this thing will bring. so unfamiliar to us we're gonna have to break it down okay let's look at it John 3 16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but they'll have everlasting life who knows that verse without looking John 3 16 for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. You can go out on the street, any big town, and talk to anybody who spent a lot of time in rescue missions and those guys on the street, alcoholics, drug users, addicts, know this verse. There are people who hold up signs at sporting events who say John 3.16 and people are familiar with the address of this verse. Aren't you cool that God allowed us to have addresses for our verses so we can find our verses quicker? Where does that verse live? Go online, put a few words in there, and it'll pop up. Acts 7.7. 7. All right, let's go look at Acts 7.7. 7. And we have an address for our verses and we can find God's heart quickly, the heart we're looking for. And let's break this verse down. What does it mean to the Lord? Let's look at that first slide. For God. Today is going to be the greatest message you ever heard. It's not the message that I'm preaching. It's the message in John 3.16. It's the greatest message out there. And for God, He's the greatest lover. You can't find anybody who loves like God. The Bible says God is love. It doesn't say He contains it. It says He is it. And you will never ever know love until you know God. There's people out there searching, looking for love in all the wrong places. <laughs> if you don't find love in the Bible, you'll never find love. John 3.16 breaks it down for us. You remember, John's emphasis is Jesus is God. And if anybody denies that out there in radio land, TV land, computer land, you come with me to a demon-possessed person. And we'll bring up the name Jesus and see what happens. Because they know who their master is. They know who their creator is. And they succumb to that voice. They don't want you and I to know the power of the name of Jesus. They don't want us to know his position. They don't want us to know his calling. They don't want us to know who he is. And they don't want us to know who theos is. That's what this word is in Greek. Theos is the great creator God. Theology, that's where we get that word. God, the study of God. And it blows my mind. People walk outside their doors and they look up into the beautiful stars, the beautiful sun, the beautiful everything, and just don't even care about who created them. Let's go do our thing. But the Bible says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day they're talking, they're uttering speech, and night unto night they're teaching knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice cannot be heard. The stars, sun, moon, the constellations speak in every language. And they say, Someone created me. Someone bigger than you. Someone almighty. There's somebody bigger than you. You need to find out who that person is. And Jesus says, he's the light of the world. He lights every man that comes into the world. And when we come and we step outside our wigwam, our TP, our treehouse, and we see these stars, we see everything, or our billion dollar mansion, and we look out and we see something bigger than us, at the moment, the very moment, I say, whoever you are, Will you please reveal yourself to me? I want to know you. The Bible says he will send more light, shed more light on that light. 
There is no village in Africa. There's no village in South America. There's no village in Papua New Guinea. There is no village here in Jonesboro where God cannot come if you will open up your heart. You don't have to know Jesus right away. You don't have to know his name's Theos and Elohim created. All you got to know is something bigger than you is out there. And when you walk outside your house, you, all you got to do is say, who are you? Will you tell me the truth about yourself? And if you pray that, God will answer it. Because God answers prayer. And the greatest message in the world begins with the greatest human being in the world. Jesus Christ, we're going to get back to him. But he was God in spirit, and he came and he taught us while he was here in the flesh. He said, God is a spirit. Theos is a spirit. And they that worship him, you must worship him in spirit and truth. It's not about rituals. It's not about keeping the sacraments. It's not about doing good and helping old ladies across the street. Guys, we were all born as goats, spiritually speaking. And goats don't make it to heaven. Only sheep do. We were all goats. How do we become a sheep? We come to God the Father and say, I need you to make me into what I can't make me. And that is a sheep of your pasture. And God does a miracle work. He said, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. He turns me from a goat to a sheep. We talked last night. Moral goats go to hell. Good goats go to hell. Goats who help old ladies across the street go to hell. Good morality will not send you to heaven. It'll keep you out of jail. It won't keep you out of hell. And so we say, hey, Lord, we got to have you. Who are you? Lord means somebody bigger than me. You know, we even do it in, in uh, kingdoms. My Lord. Talk to me, my Lord, my lady. And it's somebody who's above me, and we do obeisance to them. God is the Lord. And he says, for God, the greatest lover. Let's look at the next frame. For God, so loved. That's the greatest act. The greatest act on the planet is God loving. You see, when you look at other religions around, uh, let's just throw one out called Buddhism. Buddhism has many gods, and to appease those gods, you got to come with your sacrifice. You got to come with your meat offerings, and you got to come with your food, and you got to come with your incense, and you got to come with your sage, and your burning elements of smell good and attention getters for these stone gods, these metal gods. And you've got to appease these gods by giving to them, I give you, I give you, I give you, I give you. God says, I'm here to love you. What an amazing story. See, the real God, the one who created the entire universe, loves you. He's not seeking your harm. He's not seeking your hurt. He is not here to hate you. He's not here to make you do things you can't do. He created this world for God. He's the great Elohim, the great creator. He spoke the world into existence. And then he gave us his word. And everything in here is just as powerful as his creative power. Because this is creative power. This is what turns goats to sheep. This is what makes a sheep a better sheep. This is what helps the sheep be able to listen to the voice of that great creator. Do you know you can have a personal relationship with God, Theos, the great creator? If you'll open up your heart, you walk outside your wigwam, your house, and you say, whoever you are, I want to know the truth. And the Bible says, Jesus himself said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am life. And nobody can come to God the Father except through me. And that's where we discuss a trinity. There is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. When you read in Genesis, Elohim, I, and we talked about this, in the past, where we as uh, English-speaking people have an S at the end of words, making it plural. Hippopotamuses, right? right? In Hebrew, it's I am. I am. When you see that in Hebrew, it makes it plural. So a cherub becomes a cherubim when there's more than one cherubs. <laughs> right? <laughs> Elohim. Elo is God. Im is the gods. The Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. What do we see? We see in the beginning, God, the Father, created the world. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the earth. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And out of his mouth came light, and out of his mouth came life. And this right here came out of his mouth to 40 different writers, and they said, what? what's the next thing, Lord? And the Holy Spirit revealed to them. And 40 authors wrote on one subject. You try that today. You try that among us. You try that among us and say, here's a subject, here's a notepad and a pencil. I want you to write your feelings, your heart, your desires on that pad concerning this one subject. 
chocolate ice cream. That's our subject. Now you got your vanilla folks out there, and you got your strawberry folks out there, and you got your chocolate folks out there, and you got your, you know, whatever, Rocky Road. And people are going to have different opinions on chocolate ice cream on any subject. Puppy dogs. I'm a cat lover. I hate animals. You're going to have different opinions. And when you start to write about God, you do the same thing. Walk into any room with 40 people in it and say, Hey guys, we're going to keep you locked in here for three days. we got some pizza coming, whatever. We want you to write. Okay, three hours. I was just kidding. It's, we're going to be here for three hours. And we want you to write on the subject. We want you to just give your heart what your feelings are about God. You think everybody's going to agree? You think everybody's going to come to the same conclusion? You think uh, among all those 40 writers you won't find any mistakes? Any contradictions? Mm -mm. That's why we know the Bible's true. Because the Bible, there's no contradiction. People come to me and say, hey man, there's, the Bible's filled with so many contradictions. <laughs> Dude, I've been looking for you. Here, show me where they are. Because I've been looking for them for a long time. I ain't found them. I am so glad you showed up. Show me where they are. You can't find a contradiction in the scripture, guys. Because Jesus, God, does not contradict himself. For God, the greatest lover, so loved the greatest degree, the world. For God, the greatest lover, so loved the greatest degree, the world, the greatest number. The world word here is cosmos. And that is a harmonious, balanced creation. You know why Jesus came to this earth? Because there was nothing harmonious and balanced about his creation after Adam sinned. It was filled with chaos. It was filled with sin. It was filled with the imaginations of their heart was only evil continually. And that's what they did, and that's how they lived. And that's why God sent the flood the first time around, because the imagination of their heart was only evil. All they thought of was against God, against God, against God. For me, for me, for me, for me. Do you know what? If you are number one on your priority list, you are against God. You're a Satanist. You may not call yourself a Satanist, but the doctrine of Satanism is me first, whatever I want. It's all about me. Pleasure me. It's all about this temporary life. It's all for me. Forget everything else. I want wealth. I want fame. I want things. That's Satanism. And if you think like that, you may not have known you're Satanist, but you are. And you're inviting the enemy into your life. For God, the greatest lover, so loved the greatest degree of love, the world, the greatest number. And he loved it. He loves the world. He loves a harmonious world. And it wasn't that way. And he wants it that way. And he made a way to bring it back to harmony. For God, the greatest lover, so loved the greatest degree, the world, the greatest number that he gave the greatest act. You guys, the greatest act on the planet is sacrifice. Watch any mama who loves her children. You will know love when you see it. Love sacrifices. It gives. It doesn't take. <clears throat> see, the enemy takes. Manipulators take. The bad guys take. They just want more from you. They, they, they work their way in only to steal from you. The con men. Jesus isn't a con man. He, he came out here and he, God openly, plainly opened up the word to us and told us his heart. He said, listen here, Matt, I need you to write this. Matt wrote it. Hey, listen here, Hezekiah, you're my king. I need you to do some things. Hezekiah wouldn't listen. Hezekiah did listen. Hezekiah, whatever. And Isaiah and those guys wrote it down. Word for word, what God told the king in his private chamber. And God told the king in his private chamber many times by way of that prophet who had that finger pointing right in his face. and says, thus saith the Lord. And God has sent his prophets to Jonesboro, Arkansas, to Paragould, and we've gotten so mundane. We hold up our John 3, 16 sign, and it doesn't mean anything. It's lost its luster. It's lost its truth. It has lost what God intended to send forth with it. Because God's the greatest lover. And he's so loved with the greatest degree of the world, the greatest number, the greatest cosmos, the greatest gathering, which he wants to be, oh, in harmony, and it's in such chaos. You see, the false teachers believe out of chaos will come order. As above, so below. And they are wicked. And they are creating the chaos. They are creating the wars. They are creating everything. Why? Because they plan on sending a false man ahead to stop that and bring all a bunch of fake peace about. And he's going to come and he's going to be hollering, peace, peace, but there's not going to be any peace. It's all a joke. You see, only God can bring peace. Only God can bring order out of chaos. Only God can bring harmony out of chaos. And he shows us that truth about his love by giving to us. When was the last time you had to pay for your oxygen? You breathe. 
Now, people who have to go on oxygen bottles have to have to pay for it. They got problems. You and I get it free. He gives it to you. He gives you life. He gives you friends. You don't have to pay for friends. The Bible says Jesus is a friend that loves publicans and sinners. And there is no friend like Jesus. Jesus is a friend that's closer than a brother. The Bible says a true friend is willing to lay down his life for his friends. Jesus gave, God gave, God gives, He gives, He gives. You and I have blood pumping through our systems. My wife is a heart specialist. And it amazes her as a specialist how amazing the heart is. It has its own brain, man. It has its own, that thing wants to live, that thing wants to pump, that thing wants to keep you alive. You didn't pay for any of it. You showed up on the scene and that wonderful pump does an awesome work to keep you alive. And the Bible says the life of the flesh is in the blood. And if you don't have a heart pumping, you don't have your blood flowing. If you don't have your blood flowing, you're not receiving the nutrients and oxygen that your body needs. You've got to have these things. How much did you pay for yours? You see, God gives. God gave you your kidneys. We know people who's had kidney problems have to go on dialysis. Struggle, struggle, struggle. You and I, none of us I see are hooked up to a dialysis machine today. We may have to have appointments, maybe. But for the most part, our kidneys function. And they function well. Our bladders, everything, it's free. God gives. He gives life. He's all about giving, 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 giving. And the greatest person of all, for God, so loved, the greatest degree of love, the world, the greatest number, the greatest invitation, the greatest heart, His vision for us is to have harmony. Do you have harmony in your life? Maybe you need to start receiving what God is giving. If you want harmony, you've got to look out and say, whoever you are, great creator, great spirit in the sky, I want to know who you are. He'll reveal Himself to you as Jesus Christ. He'll reveal Himself to you as Theos, Lord of all. He'll reveal Himself, and he, the way He'll do it is through His Holy Spirit. You're going to be dealing with the Trinity when you pray that prayer. And God will move, and the same Spirit of God that moved upon the face of the water is going to move upon you. And the very same Spirit of God that made things appear when God said, let there be, and it happened, He will do the same thing in your life. And He pronounces life into your life. He pronounces grace into your life. He pronounces mercy into your life. He's so giving. He's so giving. But, will you receive it? Will you receive it? The Bible says, The fool hath said in his heart, No, God. We see in our Bible it says, There's italics. It says, There is no God. But the actual Hebrew is, The fool hath said in his heart, No, God. No. I got this one. He's giving. He's giving. He's giving. He proves his love, his enormous love. And when he gives to you, he's providing harmony. Do you have harmony in your life? Or is your life all jangled and screwed up? Your life is jangled and screwed up, and God is very, very saddened by that. And He wants to bring you harmony. Will you receive what He's given? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. The greatest gift. You see, Jesus gives us oxygen. We all receive that one. We forget to thank Him for it sometimes, probably. He gives us great kidneys. He gives us bladders. He gives us stomachs. He gives us a system that works for the most part. And do we thank Him for that? And everything give thanks. We need to thank Him in the good times. Many times, those of us who say we believe in Him, and we know John 3, 16, for God's love of the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Next verse. You know, and we just spit this stuff out, and we don't know what we're saying. But if you will receive what God has given you, just like you have His oxygen and His water, what a wonderful gift of water. Satan's trying to take that away too. You see, God gives life and your enemy wants to bring death. God brings harmony and your enemy wants to bring disharmony, disunion. He wants to create division and subdivision. Jesus Christ wants to give you unity. What a beautiful gift we had last night in Bible study. What a beautiful gift we have right here of unity. We all have the same heart, the same mind. We're all at different stages in our maturity and growing into the Lord Jesus, but we've stepped outside our wigwam and said, Who are you? And He's revealed Himself to us as Lord of all. God is good. He's good all the time. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. You see what the problem is with this world is sin. Our Papa, you guys know that everybody on the planet, all of us in this room, we talked about this last night, we all have ten of the same ancestors from Adam to Seth 
to Enosh, all the way down to Lame uh, Lamech and Methuselah and Enoch, all the way down to Noah. We all have the same ten persons in our lineage. We're all brothers and sisters. And Satan wants to divide that. Satan wants to take that away from us, that truth. Jesus wants to bring back the harmony. God wants to bring back the harmony. And the only way he could do that was when he looked at the disharmony, there was not one human who could fix it. But he wanted it so much, he said, I'll fix it. And that was his plan before the foundation of the world. For him, the Word, when you read John 1, in the beginning was the Word, capital W. And the Word, Jesus Christ, was made flesh. So the very spoken word that God spoke in the beginning, remember, in the beginning God created, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, God the Father, God the Son, and God said, and that was the Spirit of Jesus. Because the word became flesh in, in a human form where we could look at Him, we could gaze our eyes upon Him, and by His stripes we could be healed. And we could be made whole. And Jesus became flesh and He dwelt among us. And He was one of us, and He was a wallflower, He was quiet, He was out in the distance. He was meek and lowly in heart. And he said, take my yoke upon you and learn that truth. I am not an aggressive, mean God. I'm a God who seeks harmony in your life. And if you have any other preoccupation or thoughts about God other than the fact that he's harmonious and he's loving and he wants to give to you, you need to read John 3, 16 and know what it is saying. For God, the greatest lover, so loved the greatest degree of love, the world, the greatest number, that he gave the greatest act of sacrifice, his only begotten son, the greatest gift You've received the water, you've received the oxygen, you've received everything from Him. You may not be thankful, but you're never going to have a harmonious life until you receive the gift of His only begotten Son. Jesus Christ is the only one who can bring harmony into your life. Is your life disjoined, or is there harmony there? Jesus is the result of God's love for you. He's God's wonderful greatest gift offered to you, the greatest gift. His only begotten Son, He who knew no sin became sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God through Him, by Him, for Him. Ask any devil who He is. Ask any demonic spirit, who is Jesus to you? If He can answer, they many times won't answer, but when you get them talked down and they know they're about to come out, they'll start saying stuff. They'll start flipping dude. Just like they do in jail and they're interviewing some guy. Demons are crazy, crazy individuals. What are they? Fallen angels and the offspring of fallen angels. Read your Bible, Genesis 6. Read all the way through the Bible. We see that Satan was cast out of heaven. We see all that story. We know who they are. They are the enemies of God. And what they want to do is create chaos in your life. Is your life classified by two things? One of two. Harmony or chaos. I guarantee if it's chaos, you do not have Jesus in your life and you're not receiving the greatest gift God is offering. For God so loved the world that He gave the best thing that He had, Himself. And God is a spirit and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And the spirit of Jesus, you read the book of John. The book of John is, uh, concentrates on the last ten days of Jesus' life and it's all about His being God and that's why they picked up stones to stone Him because thou being a man makes thyself God. And they come against him, and the demons still hate that truth. And the demons try to, try to conjure it up, and they do the same thing Satan did in the Garden of Eden. Hath God really said? I mean, I know you're saying he said this, and, and the word, you know, yeah, got out there, but did he really mean it like that? The Bible says when you receive the Son of God, we receive the Spirit of God. Why? Because the Son of God, the greatest gift that's ever been offered, is sitting on a throne, a physical throne in a physical heaven with His Spirit Father. God's on a throne. We read that in Revelation 4 and 5. And next to Him is another throne. And that's where Jesus, the physical Son, is. The glorified physical Son is. I and the Father are one. He said it over and over. They picked up stones of stone because He, being a man, made Himself God. They killed Him. We don't kill Thee for uh, whatever good things. We kill Thee for blasphemy. They couldn't find anything wrong with Jesus, so they busted him for being right. And speaking the truth, I'm God. And they said, no, you're not. That's blasphemy. Because they practiced their practices for 1,500 years through the feast and through the, through the harvest, and they didn't see him when he showed up. He said, you've refused me. You've refused the gift. I'm going to the Gentiles. Aren't you thankful, Jonesboro? Aren't you thankful, Paragould? Aren't you thankful, folks, that he came to us, the non-Jew? And offered us eternal life and those who would freely receive this gift. What do you say? For God 
so loved deeply this world. Not just this world, he loved the harmony world that he created. And this chaotic, disjointed world just unnerves him. And he sent his favorite person himself. He's my favorite person too. See, God knows beside him there is no other. You and I, when you come to that conclusion, we understand that there is no other besides him. And he's lifted the name of Jesus high above everything else. That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That Jesus Christ is Adonai. That's a name for God. That Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If I could explain the Trinity to you, I'd be God. I can't. But I know what the Bible says about it. As far as I know, I know what the Bible says about it. And God gave himself to us, the greatest gift. For God so loved the world that he gave himself in a human form. And you'll understand that Jesus didn't begin at his birth. Jesus continued. He's the eternal one. The Bible teaches the doctrine of his eternality. He's eternal. He's forever. He's the creator. And he came to this earth, vehicled himself through a woman's body to get here. And he put on flesh. He put on the robe of flesh. We beheld him as, a, as of the only begotten of God, full of grace and truth. For God gave himself, his only begotten son, that whosoever, the greatest invitation. Mm. I don't care how bad you've been. Because he don't. Oh, but I'm too bad. And the devils are lying to you and they're conjuring up thoughts in your head that you can't be forgiven because you've been so bad. You've been so evil. I'm here to tell you, he said whosoever and he meant whosoever. He wants whosoever you are. I don't care who you are. He wants you to have the greatest gift himself because he seeks harmony in your life. You know what the problem with John 3.16 is? People won't take it backwards. For God's little world, they gave his little Let's take it backwards. That's what we're doing today. He's the greatest lover. He's the greatest God. He's the greatest one. That whosoever. Do you find yourself fitting in that category of whoever? Whosoever. Whosoever will may come. That's what the scripture says. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how deep you've gone into your sin, into your prison. I don't care how deep you've gone. Jesus says, I'll find you there. And if you will acknowledge that there is a greater one than you, ask who that is. He'll convince you it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. We talked about that last night. He asked Peter, who do men say that I am? He said, well, they, they're saying that you're, you know, Elijah and Elias and, you know, the great prophets. He goes, stop, stop. But who do you say that I am? He says, you're, you're the very one, the chosen one from God to come to us. The anointed one to Christ. And Jesus looked at him and says, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Because flesh and blood will never tell you that Jesus is the Lord. Only the Spirit of God will convince you of that. Whosoever, it can reach you. Don't think you're too far gone. Jesus loves you, man. In your sin. See, one of the lies the devil says is, I've got to clean up my act. Make myself presentable before I come to the Lord. You can't do that. You're a goat. you got to come to him as a messy, filthy, rotten, stinking goat. And you got to go to his cross. And you look up to him in faith and you say, Jesus, I believe that this cross is a finished work for me. Because you said it was. It is finished. Te telestai. You said that. And I believe it's finished for me too. And I believe when you said whosoever you meant me. And you come with all your rags. You come with all your leprosy. You come with all your sin. And you confess your sin to him. Which he already knows. He's not wanting you to tell on yourself so you can reveal truth to him. He wants you to tell on yourself so you can reveal truth to yourself. I am a sinner. I am in need of you. I need transformation. I repent of my sin that has put you on this cross. See, Jesus Christ wasn't forced on a cross. He came to die on a cross. He said, I, I must do this. Now, his human side was like, man, Lord, please, if there's any other way, take this away. And then he snapped out of it and he goes, nope, we're going to do the right thing. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. See, that's the opposite of Satanism. Satanism is my will be done. Christianity is thy will be done. And we say, Lord, you're the greatest giver. You only want the best for me. You want harmony in my life. You're the greatest God of all. You're the only wise God. You're wonderful. You're a giver, 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 and you only give the best. You gave yourself for me. And because humans did the wrong, a human had to suffer for the wrong. God couldn't find one. So he came himself to become a human, to die for all of us. And if we will trust in our substitute, Jesus Christ, 
the greatest gift. And it doesn't matter how evil you've been. Whosoever. Boy, that'll bring harmony to someone's life. That'll bring peace where there's turmoil and chaos. That'll bring grace and mercy where there's only condemnation and confusion. Jesus does that. Are you condemned? Are you confused? Are you messed up? Is there chaos in your life? You need Jesus. And you need to come to Him. It doesn't matter who you are and how bad you've been. Whosoever. And you come as a sinner. You've got to come as who you really are, who God knows you to be. And you've got to confess every bit of that. Vile, rotten, rancid. But I was raised in church all my life. You are vile, rotten, and rancid. Since I was five, I did everything in church. It's not about doing things in church. It's about coming to a cross as a nasty goat needing to be transformed into a righteous sheep. And only God, the shepherd, dying for you. He said, I love you this much, man. I love you this much. And he reached out and said, I love you that much. And we look at him and we believe and we say, hey, I'm a sorry old sinner. And he said, hey, only a sinner saved by grace, man. I'll do it for you. Whosoever. It's the greatest invitation. He doesn't leave anybody out. Judas should have gone to heaven. He walked with Jesus for three and a half years and he walked with the shepherd and he never became a sheep. He had never allowed. He didn't live long enough to see the resurrection of Jesus. In betraying Jesus and casting down. See, that's what Satanists do. They, they get so belligerent and they get so evil and they call curses on God. They hate God. They hate the Son. That's Cradle of Filth is a satanic band. And what are they talking about? They're talking about God in a little manger. That's a cradle of filth. When people say, holy crap, what they're saying, they're referring to Jesus. They're calling Him crap. He's the only thing that's holy. And so we Christians have adopted that lingo. I'm guilty of that. The Lord's been teaching me. There's holy and there's profane. There's no mixing. There's no middle ground. It's either holy or profane. And God is holy. And He told us in 1 Peter 1.16, Be ye holy. For I am holy. He wasn't telling us, oh, I've got to make all the right decisions because you can't. What he was doing was declaring you holy. Be holy. Aren't you thankful for that? Aren't you thankful? And the word holy means separated. How do I get separated? I come to God with the, the group. Everybody. Only sinners. Group of sinners. The wide. Broad. A bunch. But whoever will stop at the cross, one-on-one, -on -one, confess their sins personally, he turns us from that goat into a sheep and he saves us. Whosoever shall call in the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I realize that God so loved me. See, in the fact that it's the greatest number of people, it's also an individual thing. He did it if it would only have been me who wronged him. He loves me that much. He would have traded himself just for me. And that's how we arrive at the cross. Just me. Just as I am. Not changing before I get there. Just as I am. How I live. Who I am. Without one plea. My only plea is this, that thou, my God, has died for me. And he says he tr transforms us into a new creation. And if any man be in Christ, he is that new creation. And old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. You no longer have to live in a world of chaos and struggle and unconformity. We are now, the Bible says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So you'll know God's heart. We read this Bible, know this Bible, understand this Bible, so I'll know what God's thinking. Just like those 40 authors did. They didn't come up on this stuff on their own. It's a God-breathed book, and we're told that in the New Testament. God breathed every word. Every word of God is pure. Every yod and every tittle, every comma and every period. He said, do not mess one of those up. When you scribes are transferring from this scroll to this one, because this one's got no... You transfer it word for word, line on line, precept on precept, yod and tittle. I want every dot, every comma in the perfect place. And if it's messed up, and the scribes would do that. The scribes would be writing, and when they would mess it up, they'd scrap the entire scroll, burn it, and start over again. And every time they come to the name God, Elohim, they would set their pen down, go take a ceremonial bath, put on new clothing, grab a new pen and an inkwell, and write the name God and continue on from there. So they come to the name God again. They would get up and do the same thing. That's how much they reverenced the Holy One. And they reverenced His Word that much. And you and I have so many Bibles in our house and we don't even know the Word. There's coming a day, I believe, in America that we're going to wish we had. Had it hid in our hearts. God's going to bless us anyway. He promised He'd bless His children. 
And that's why we have this Bible study, so we know the Word of God. We know the mind of Christ, and that whosoever. Does that include you? Does that include me? Does that include those people that you don't like down the street? Whosoever. Whosoever will may come. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth. The greatest simplicity. God wanted to make it to where a five-year-old can do this. Ain't He good? Ain't He good? You don't have to wait till you're 21 to enjoy this. God says that it's all about the children. And unless you come to me like a child, how's that? Innocently, pure in heart. This whole world hanging out with us taints people, taints the little ones. They grow up and they end up being like us. Jesus Christ wants to head that off at the pass. So he made it simplistic enough for children to understand it. My wife was sitting in a study and she was 10 years old. Just sitting there. And the Holy Spirit of God came up on her and said, you need to be saved. And she began to cry and said, I know it. Salvation. I know it. I know you're God. I know I'm a sinner. I know you want to save me. He made it easy. But we have made it difficult. We have added a bunch of rules to salvation just like the Pharisees and Jesus they did. That's why he was so angry. You can't add anything to what God did. God's a giver, 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 not a taker like all your other gods. You don't have to come before God and offer him a bunch of things to appease him. You come to him and understand that he's offered himself to appease himself of my stupidity, my sin, my sorriness. And God turns us around. He said that whosoever believeth, do you believe? Or do you deny? Do you understand? You see, the children of Israel were given the law. They, they, they were given God's commandments. They were given His heart. And they rebelled. And the Bible says that they wandered around in the wilderness for 40 years because of their unbelief. And they all became dead carcasses in the desert. Everybody who was over 20 years of age, they all died out in the desert not being able to become uh, people who enjoyed the promised land. Only two men did it because they were men of faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Not hard or difficult. Impossible to please God. I must first believe that He exists. I was able to share that New Year's Eve to our atheist. you got to believe that He exists. Atheists don't believe He exists. They're not pleasing the Lord. you got to have faith. Show me proof. Jesus did that. 2,000 years ago, God came to this earth and He gave Himself as a sacrifice. And whosoever the greatest invitation shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's a bunch of shalls there, not mites and ifs and ands. And, and oh, I forgot one hoop. Sign right here. Sign this dotted line. Okay. There's none of that. It's believing. Childlike faith. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth do you believe that He is the Christ? Do you believe that He is the Savior? That's the only way you're going to heaven. You've got to quit trusting in you and your works and the things you can perform and how good you can clean up. A shiny turd is still a turd. Right? Glory to God. You can't clean yourself up, guys. We've got to come to God for a changing. And only God can do that. Whosoever believeth like a child, simplistic faith. Lord, I, I, I've got a bunch of questions. God doesn't mind us having questions. He, he loves answering questions because He's the truth. He's got the answer. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above Him, there's no other. Jesus is the way. And we come to Him and say, i, I, I got a bunch of answers, but here's what I do. I do believe that you want to bring peace into my life. And you want to remove chaos. And you want to give, give, give to me. And I receive everything you've given. I right now confess the fact that you've given me oxygen. You've given me water. You've blessed me with friends. And you've given that to me. You're a great giver. And you want to give me eternal life. You want me to be blessed in this life and the life to come. And I accept that eternal life. I believe. Jesus is the enemy of unbelief. He has a problem with people who will not see by faith. And we are under the judgment of God. Somebody who will not believe is under the judgment of God. But the just, the Bible says, those who are justified in His sight as though we've never sinned, He's declared us holy. Only those people, who are those people? They're the ones who live by faith. The just shall live by faith. I declare you holy. I, I believe all that, Lord. He says, well, yeah, cool. Let's do this. 
and we're in the family of God, and immediately he transforms us. That's easier than I thought. That's what the guy said last night. Well, yeah. God wanted a five-year-old to be able to do it. He didn't make it difficult. Jump through hoops. Now you got to work out so you can make up this next, you know, rung of the ladder. Mm -mm. Come just believe. God honors belief above all. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. What is faith? Faith is seeing, though it doesn't exist, as though it does exist. I believe it. I believe it true. God honors that. And so whoever believeth in Him, Jesus Christ, the greatest person you'll ever meet, the greatest person you'll ever know. Every time you come to Him in prayer, every time you come to Him in faith, it's nothing but blessedness there. And He gives even when you revert back to, to your old goat ways, as though you're a sheep, but you go to act like a goat once in a while and are stupid and make the wrong choices, He's still there and He's so gentle because He's a word called long-suffering or patient. You've never met anybody so patient as He. He's long-suffering. I mean, for a long time, He loves you. And He wants you to believe in Him. In who? God gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should never perish. Let's look at that. Shall not perish. Somebody asks you the question, hey, if you died today, do you know that you would go to heaven? You need to be able to say, yes, I shall not perish in hell. It's guaranteed in writing. Because I believe, I've placed all my faith in His salvation and the fact that He wants to make my world a non-chaotic one and He wants to bless me in this life and the one to come. Yes, I, I, I believe that I am not going to perish. And the word shall means shall. Doesn't mean might. Whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish in hell. Isn't that a wonderful, wonderful word? But is the next word. That's the greatest difference. you got to love the buts in Scripture. Because God will send some curses along and He'll say, but if you'll trust in me, if you'll believe in me, I'll send you blessing after blessing after blessing after blessing. Because we are bent on cursing first. We are bent on disobedience. We are bent against the cross. We are bent against God's heart. We are bent against holiness. But God transforms us and we come back to Him. And whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish in hell. But it's not just the fact that I don't have to go to hell. There is a great blessing. But I shall have guaranteed shall not have hell, I shall have heaven. Now, do you know that with confidence? Or do you drive down the road and wonder, I wonder if I'm really going to go to heaven. God wants us to know. John said, I have written these things unto you that you may know that you have everlasting life. God wants you resting. God wants that five-year-old kid not worrying, oh, did God really save me? Did he really turn me into a sheep? Without faith, you can't please him. I must believe that he exists. And number two, I must believe that he rewards everyone who diligently seeks him. He's a rewarder. He's a giver, giver, giver. He wants to bless you. That's what he does. For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son himself, that whosoever, I don't care who you are, I don't care how bad you've been, believeth the greatest simplicity in Him, the greatest person, shall not perish. The greatest promise, but the greatest difference, have the greatest certainty, everlasting life, the greatest promise. God is good. God is great. Let us thank Him for more than food. Let us thank Him for everything in everything. John 3.16 Know it. Share it. That's all you need to know to tell people about heaven. For God the greatest lover, so loved the greatest degree, the world the greatest number, that He gave the greatest act, His only begotten Son the greatest gift, that whosoever the greatest invitation, believeth the greatest simplicity, in Him the greatest person, shall not perish the greatest certainty, or the greatest promise, the greatest certainty and promise, but they shall have the greatest certainty, everlasting life, the greatest, greatest place, the greatest position, the greatest seat in the house. Because God says when we believe, we are, seated, or we are set with Him in heavenly places. And He lifts us up. And it's now as though we are already in heaven. We have eternal life right now, not eternal death. We had that. I shall not perish when I believe in Him. Do you know the greatest one of all? Have you come and believed the greatest story of them all? As opposed to just seeing John 3.16, do you see how huge that story is and that's all you need to know to share the gospel with others around you?
Jesus wants you to be saved today. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter what you do. Whosoever. Whosoever. Whosoever means you. Whosoever means me. Whosoever means those people you don't get along with. God loves them too. Hey guys, we do want to thank you for joining us today. God bless you. Jesus is the greatest story ever told. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all present. Want to be present in your life. Do you find harmony in your life? Do you find chaos? Jesus wants to bring it about to have unity of joy, of love, of peace. The answer is you and your humbleness, your humility, coming to the cross and accepting Jesus, confessing your sin. He wants to save you. He wants to give you life. He wants to bring harmony to it. Will you do that today? And let us know if you've done that. We'd like to be able to help you. We have the most loving group of people at this Bible study you've ever met. And if you're needing friends and a family, we'd love to see you. You need us. We need you. God bless you, and we'll see you next time.